My name is Shannon Kemp, and I'm the executive editor for Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining the first Dataversity webinar on cognitive computing. Today, we have a panel that will be discussing understanding the new world of cognitive computing, moderated by Steve Ardiri. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights of questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the recording of this session and slides and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. With that, I will turn the webinar directly over to Steve to get us started. Hello and welcome. Shannon. Uh, as Shannon said, um, uh, we have a one hour to go through uh, a slide deck with uh, excited about this panel. Um, which I'll introduce shortly, or they'll introduce themselves. But essentially, uh, what we're going to be doing is really kind of covering um, in a fluid um, nature all aspects of uh, cognitive computing, the analytic side, the machine learning, touch upon deep learning, other subject matter. And I understand that the, uh, this, uh, Shannon will be releasing this uh, uh, white paper on, uh, uh, that was kind of queued off a of survey. And will be published when, Shannon? Since of the webinar, we'll see the a copy of the re research paper uh, when in the email. Great. Excellent. So logistics on that. And uh, so without further ado, um, let's just plunge right in. So my name is Steve Ardiri. I, uh, I'm an independent practitioner. I advise um, uh, early stage software startups, cognitive computing, AI. Machine learning is uh, is a sweet spot. I've been doing it for, for 20 plus years, and uh, and uh, uh, today we have the following panel. And each person introduce themselves. Tony, we'll start with you, please. My name is uh, Tony Saris, and I'm a uh, independent consultant uh, in a boutique semantic technology consulting firm that I call Into Semantics. Uh, I also work uh, uh, as a technology evangelist for a company called Primal that develops semantic technologies. Uh, my background is originally in database technologies. I got into enterprise modeling as a result of that. And then in the last wave of semantic technologies, or AI, in the late uh, 1980s and early 90s, um, I got really involved in ontology and conceptual schema modeling. Actually, uh, I went to work at Unisys uh, in metadata and repository technologies and then have been uh, very much uh, uh, trying to push this uh, trend toward uh, representation and taking advantage of uh, knowledge for uh, personal assistants and software agents and that sort of thing. That's my primary area of interest. Great. Jim, please. Yeah, I'm Gabilis. I'm with IBM, a company a little over a century old. I myself am considerably younger, but getting up there in years. Uh, I'm an interview veteran, as it says on the slide. I've been in IT for about 28 years now. Been with IBM for just a, over a, a two and a half years. Uh, I was an industry analyst before joining IBM, all, all around big data. And I, I'm IBM, as it says, big data evangelist. That means I speak on the power of big data and analytics in business and in life in general. And um, I, you know, I represent you know, our huge brain trust and all things big data. I play a marketing role role in product marketing of big data analytics solutions for IBM, and just as important, I'm the editor-in-chief, a uh, fairly new appointment, chief of IBM Data Magazine, our thought leadership forum for things to do with cognitive computing and big data and analytics, and uh, we, uh, we publish, it's a, basically it's a magazine or a forum now, very social, and brings together the best thinking from inside IBM, but also so from our partners and from industry influencers who would like to contribute uh, articles uh, to be published to um, our audience. So I'm happy to be on the webinar today. Thank you. Adrian, please. I'm sorry, I'm just laughing because that's quite a list of tasks for, uh, for James these days. I remember when he just had to be an industry analyst. I'm Adrian Bowles. <laughs> um, the market intelligence firm called Storm Insights, uh, and cognitive computing is one of the areas that, uh, that we're covering. I read myself sometimes as a recovering academic. I used to be a serious computer science professor, where AI was 
one of the, um, the areas that I worked in, and then I've taught in a number of business schools, but for the last oh, 15 or 20 years, I've primarily been an analyst and an advisor to, um, to temps and to tech buyers. So I'm very excited to uh, be participating in this, working with Steve. And I should in a plug. Um, I don't have a magazine to plug, but uh, with my friends and colleagues, Judith Hurwitz and uh, Marcia Kaufman, we'll have a book out on cognitive computing with John Wiley in January. Terrific, terrific. So um, we talked about the survey, um, and this and which is going to be this white paper that Shannon had mentioned is going to be published uh, Thursday. You get a copy of. But I'm going to share with you before we get into the the flow and the the, the presentation here are some of the highlights from the from the survey. Um, and uh, so uh, a couple of things is is that really stand out is over half the respondents, uh, you know, clarity in terms of the business perspective. A lot of the materials and analysts report and even articles are a little bit on the technical side. And a lot of the respondents felt that they really needed to provide a little more clarity in the uh, in the business aspects, um, other types of resources in terms of how to you know how do you implement these type of systems due to you know a lack of understanding of the business case. Um, a couple other things that stood out there was this notion of well, already you got our hands full with a lot of NoSQL big data projects, and now trying to add on cognitive computing on top of that. And uh, and that's that's uh, part of the uh, the uh, the uh, the tension in terms of, uh, of of getting some of these projects kicked off. Um, uh, the plans. With that said, this is uh, you know uh, organizations' plans with respect to implementation. So you think you know, and if it's a little hard to read here, roughly there you know than 50 percent that still don't know and whether it's how applicable it is because they don't have this clear understanding and of, uh, of, of of mapping the business case with the technical case, but encouraging that uh, in the last two metrics there there are you know they are tracking developments to begin some type of roadmap about 15 percent and almost 15 percent or between 10 and 15 percent actually have uh, have active plans. Um, so back to uh, you know what can cognitive computing do to uh, improve current methods? Um, the shortage of of skill sets, not you know, a combination of data scientists, machine learning experts. Again, this comes up. This came up loud and clear with almost 50% stating that hey, we have our hands full, you know, teasing in big data, no SQL, and we haven't really constructed the cognitive computing uh, business case. And a lot of them are already pegged with too much to do and too little time. To kick things off here with uh, with a definition. It's always to have a definition. I actually, came up with this in the in the, you know as a as a as a uh, as thing to kind of frame to get people's back. And say enough, if you take this is very good to prove uh, it's it's a good you know at least seventy percent. But interesting enough that you'll see when you get the uh, the white paper that the white color for comments and. Terms of people's, you know, own opinions. So I'm going to turn it for the first panel, you know, round robin. Uh, Jim, Adrian, uh, Tony, um, we're going to get into deeper in this. But what, at first blush, what, what, you know, what would you add this or 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 compliment or what have you? Um, uh, I can start. Sure. Jim Kabilis here. It's a good start for a definition when I. Uh, when we conceptualize cognitive computing, the core of what's brand new here, you know, the, I, often, I characterize it as AI for the 21st century. What does that mean exactly? Well, unstructured data is at the center of, uh, of, of, of what the applications of cognitive computing, and you've got that here, but it's really multi-structured, so this is correct. Um, machine learning um, is also very much machine learning model. Models, uh, unsupervised, especially unsupervised, but also supervised learning to learn from fresh feeds of multi-structured data. Important, you've got that in here. Natural language processing, I think as much as it unstructured is, you know, is, is a human conversation, human verbiage that the sense needs to be pulled out of that. It's not obvious to a machine 
can't pull it out with uh, without the aid of some special, you know, algorithms, machine learning models. You had a lot of the important things right in here, um, and you've you've tied the business value in as well in terms of better outcomes. It's really all about uh, you know using the power of cognitive computing to find not obvious insights within massive data sets, and they're using it all the time. Not obvious insights that human beings just using their eyeballs and their brains unassisted uh, wouldn't be able to drive. Um, so in many ways, it's an, it's an extension of the human cognition apparatus, you know, our gray matter uh, in the cloud, uh, leveraging all the, the, the advanced analytics that, that we can, uh, quote, unquote, throw at it. So I think this right. is a good, good start. Great. Uh, Adrian, do you want anything to add? Uh, Tony, Sarah. Thank you. Oh. Uh, Tony, Sarah. Uh, I was... Thank you, Adrian. Um, uh, I think it really struck me about this is it's one of those cases of the elephant in the dark room, right? I think people are going to experience cognitive computing in different ways, coming at it from different perspectives. I think you've included in this definition those different ways that you can come to it. I think in a lot of cases today, people see uh, their language processing. They've experienced Siri uh, or Google Now or one of the other tools. Um, maybe they've worked with machine learning. They're big data scientists. They experience it that way. But I think it's really the caution of all those things that is really going to ultimately get us where we need to be. And as I said, my personal bent is what do you do with it? You have that. You use it for decision making to automate some aspect of what would otherwise be a human cognitive process to make decisions uh, in, the, in the role of an, a virtual personal assistant or an automated assistant, and for some business goal, making your job, your task that you're doing more efficient or providing you more discovery into content that, that you wouldn't have got otherwise, uh, recommendations, uh, really just a helper to a human uh, for, for better business outcomes. Right. Good. Good. Jim? Yeah. I know Steve had uh, a number of conversations about this. I actually feel like this should have been a, a fourth possible answer, which is this is pretty good, but I would take some out. Uh, and <laughs> I would add more. Because uh, one of my my uh, problems with the way the the markets are evolving right now is, is uh, as, as a different perspective, and everybody thinks what they're looking at is cognitive computing. So. I think of anything that has a learning from experience element to it uh, as being kind of baseline cognitive computing. And while natural language is important, and it's certainly part of uh, the greater scheme of things for cognitive computing, I think there's some stuff that's going on right now that doesn't use uh, natural language, things in uh, neural hardware architectures, for example, or even you know, it's, um, shown off recently with Project Atom and Google Brain, where you're dealing now with um, processing that's living, uh, so there's no natural language involved. So I think it's a good framework to, to work from, and just the fact that we can have a good conversation on it means it. it was right, I'm going to cover that downstream in the slides here. The so thing that, I just like quickly elaborate on what Adrian said. Uh, it would be quick here. I liked his yep. uh, phrase, learning from experience. Yep. You know, cognition, the rational thought processes, are just one component of everybody's experience. There's affect, that's emotions, there's sensation. And there's the experience of and volition, I, I, I call it. There's cognitive computing, everything we're describing. There's affective computing, like uh, sentiment analysis. There's sensory computing, Internet of Things. And what I call volitional computing, things like decision automation, next best action, are together need to be incorporated to the notion of what do you need some total in terms of capabilities for a system to learn from it. You know, 360 degree experience. I think cognitive computing by itself is not enough to capture the entire what needs to go into an intelligent experience else system. That's a good point, and we're gonna we're gonna pick up on that. One really want to focus right from the get go is that there is a lot of similarities. In fact, there's more similarities in the big data and cognitive computing stack depicted by this generic. Uh, 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 so I, I kind of like uh, there's roughly there's there's really uh, five layers that I have here. You know, it starts with your data sources, then it you know typically goes through some type of ETL with NLP, and there's a it's literally the same, pretty much the same symmetry here, where it starts to differentiate a little bit as the middle layer, depending on what you're using, and it's really a combination of it. There's there's SQL, there's no SQL, there's RDF, 
stuff. There's there's other you know op, you know object stores. What we're seeing over the last year is just a plethora of these Hadoop ecosystems. You know, Clara Horton work, Platfora, uh, that are that are forming, and these are these are now IBM. transforming into enterprise data hubs. You know, to be kind of you know butt up against uh, enterprise data warehouse. What I wanted to point out here, and then turn this over for discussion, is the difference really starts to kick in are the upper two layers. Okay, so yeah, you can do descriptive, predictive. Uh, analytics with big data, where, where that's why I include the, the prescriptive and cognitive. If you go from left to right, then we're really going to see some of the, you know, and we're going to get into the differentiators, believe me, and, uh, these are the similarities. And then it's different types of applications, uh, just like IBM and, and others. There's different UIs depending on what vertical and, uh, and who you're addressing, whether it be clinicians, knowledge workers, consumers. So comments? Jim, uh, whoever wants to start off. Yeah, this is Jim again. Um, I, I like, like this. Um, you like the fact that at the very top, you put engagement. That's you know, not a component of the big data stack as anybody conceives it, but it's fundamental to the cognitive computing stack. I mean, when, when people think about cognitive systems like IBM Watson or or movie versions of some things like you know, like you know, everybody knows Hal, but you know, Siri. It's about engaging human beings um, in a conversation around the data, however conceptualized. So it's all about engagement to do drive decision support and guidance to human beings trying to make decisions in various contexts. And the fact that you put engagement at the top layer here, I think, is 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 bang on correct. You know, everybody knows this week that IBM and Apple entered into an alliance. Uh, going forward, and everybody, you know, one of the shorthands that the journalist uses, uh, you know, how will Watson and Siri play together? And, you know, that really in many ways is one of the things that we are grappling with in terms of, yeah, they're both doing well, conversational computing on top of control computing, on top of cognitive computing, the three C's here. Uh, it's exciting. You know, it's, in other words, how can Watson or Siri or any other cognitive system, automated system, pass the Turing test? <laughs> yeah, we're, yeah, we're oh. going to talk widely about that, right? Uh, yeah. I actually have some. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned that, Jim, because I actually have some slides downstream that really get into what the focus on the upper two layers after we cover the symmetry and the similarities between big data and cognitive computing. Uh, Adrian, comments, observations. I heard that. Tony. Yes, I would just say that that I, I agree 100 percent that I think. It it's about what you do with the data, and I think that's where the complementary relationship between the two comes in. I think uh, uh, we're so focused in, in, in uh, data, in, in analyzing it with machine learning tools, but that is a, a domain that's, that's very much left to data scientists or, or uh, with vision tools, maybe exposed it more to people in the business, but I think one of the things that we're hearing from people that want to know what the, the business value of collecting and analyzing all that data is, and I think that is setting it up to be exploited by uh, cognitive technologies that can now take advantage of that, that knowledge that's been mined and, and the next step made explicit so that it can actually be used by predictive systems or by cognitive systems, and I think the whole U.S. Uh, uh, and, and application API piece of that is is uh, uh, the, the gap there at this point. Exactly. So, so the, the the interesting question, and this is where you know we want to kick out. We have to understand the symmetry and the similarities. What are, what are the key differences? So, I took a first start with uh, kind of tongue in cheek, uh, taking gaping void here on the differences. In short, um, so big data is more in the information. And then cognitive computing, where you're adding contextual associations, really, you know, really is more along, you know, knowledge. You know, that's why it's, you know, there's a Google knowledge graph and there's Watson and so on and so forth. But more specifically, what we teased out, in my opinion, here's the three key differences of, of cognitive computing. So I'd like to turn this open to the panel. Well, I think it is uh, a, a kind of taking advantage of, of all the uh, the uh, knowledge that's sort of implicit in big data. It has to be made explicit. So those patterns that are getting uh, exposed, what do those patterns mean? 
mean, they mean? How can we use them in a particular business context? Uh, and why are they valuable to us? And I think that this layer that, that we that we're now tasked with uh, with adding on and making uh, explicit to people so they can understand what it does and how they can use it. Right. Hey, Jim. Yeah, I'm just I'm actually making some notes on this because I don't think I've seen um, this particular slide in the past. I like it. You know, I look at learning and I I say that learning is sort of the the fundamental thing for cognitive uh, systems. The three words that, that generally come up are past relationships and context, and they're all related. Um, going to early in my, my, uh, my in, um, for, for business, we always got the stack going from you know data to um, information to knowledge, and then if you really wanted to get people worked up, you'd talk about wisdom, but <laughs> um, here, where we're where we're looking at as you know, how do we take something, um, how to extract something of value out of a lot of data? Is first of all finding the patterns, finding the relationships, putting some context around it so that it can be used, um, general for business decisions or for research decisions, whatever the the option is. I think that, um, when you get into inference hypothesis. Um, adapting and improving, that's the learning part that we're talking about. And so um, I, I really like to focus on your third bullet point there, that that's what um, I was looking at in terms of experience-based uh, improvement that doesn't require reprogramming. So, yeah, I, I think you've got it here. I think you've, you've kept, this is really nice, because I think you, you hit the nail on the head. What's uh, differentiating now is that um, there's so much data and so many different patterns that might be potentially findable within the data, but there aren't enough human beings on Earth who can be trained to be data scientists. Even if everybody on Earth was given the most powerful data science tools available, and everybody went and did it, got a PhD in you know computer science or you know stat or whatever, you still wouldn't have enough resources to find all the valuable insights. So what I'm getting is that automation is absolutely essential. You don't have, that the the models themselves will learn from fresh data. The models will find the sense. The models will adapt. Machine learning models and so forth. Without the need for direct pro programming here, really direct modeling uh, and simulation by human. Um, so automation is absolutely essential for the human race not to get swamped by all the data coming in, but but also to drive not only find the insights in an automated in as, in as close to an automated fashion as we can make, but drive those insights in a fairly automated fashion downstream into all the applications or decision points where they'd be needed without the need to go and write any code by any human being. It just Correct. happens mathematically or mathematically in in the infrastructure. That's right. one. Yeah. Well said. Well said. And well said. Um, uh, to go into some of the building blocks that has led, and this is this is you again, Jim, regarding how cognitive computing can take the semantic web to the next level. This was a post you did earlier this year. Can you elaborate a bit? Sure. I'm thinking of charging a nickel every time somebody cites me. Um, you know, <laughs> my, at least my name. But um, yeah. So the semantic web. No, actually, you know, a big part of my job at IBM is I'm, you know, I, I blogs every week in various channels, including diversity. So um, it was back in January. I was, think, I was thinking about the very topic of AI for the 21st century, and I was thinking, okay, what's missing from general discussions or specific discussions of kind of computing to, to make to make um, this reality, AI. And how do we normally perceive uh, the branches of AI? And clearly, semantic web and semantic analysis, uh, related natural language processing, and so much more, has been a discussion for a long time. And so when you look at, um, you know, find the sense in the unstructured content. Um, I say unstructured in this, in this context. I'm referring not just unstructured, but also especially to media, you know, audio and video and so forth. Um, what's absolutely essential is that as you extract um, the, the, the patterns, um, you're able then to tag 
patterns, the data, the, the streams, you know, deepen the metadata uh, that gets associated with that content and, and share that, 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 that metadata downstream to all the consuming applications so they can fully interpret all that content, those objects in their full, whatever the relevant context is. I thought, gosh, the semantic web people have had those standards and those technologies for a long time in terms of all and RDF and ontologies and taxonomies that needs to be brought into the overall cognitive computing discussion uh, as a key part of what I've uh, elsewhere called thick metadata to, to enable semantic computing as an integral component of cognitive computing. Because when we think about cognitive computing, many people who aren't really um, experts in this area, they think of structured data. They think of just oh, it's just more of sort of the uh, decision automation on, stru on, on structured data, um, you know, like standard core enterprise business applications. But a lot, most of the new applications of cognitive computing are not only completely unstructured sources, but where the the semantics is not defined in a in say um, in an R structure or whatever in advance. It needs to be extracted from the content and then mapped into a semantic vocabulary of one sort or another and managed in a, you know repositories and so forth. So for cognitive computing to achieve its its uh, you know its its, its promise, you're, we're going to need that thick metadata layer that incorporates semantic tagging uh, you know form and so forth. That was that was the germ of my thought there. Well said, and 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 a couple of instantiations of this is, of course, you know, Google's acquisition of MetaWeb a few years ago. That is that is forming the base of of their knowledge graph, and there's a lot of graphs, but that's essentially a strong example of that. Right. Um, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna give you a real shot here uh, after perusing your Twitter stream. I kind of like this depiction, Adrian, of of uh, this tweet you did uh, in June. Regarding how IBM Watson, you uh, had a, about a bit of interaction with them. How it, how the foundations layer maps to the cognitive computing. Can you just get some more, uh, some of your thoughts on this? Do it. Um, you there? Okay, I'll, I'll come to it. Tony, well, let me interrupt you here. We had a question come in from yeah. the uh, previous slide. So what distinguishes cognitive computing from data mining and machine learning? Uh, it's, uh, well, we're going to cover machine learning um, uh, uh, in, in, in a lot of detail right after these series of slides here. But on data, did you want to take the data mining uh, question, Jim? I'm so muted the entire time. I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Yeah, question on, uh, we're going to cover machine learning, so let's not, uh, but uh, the, the analogies between cognitive computing and data mining? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, well, data mining, of course, is the process of finding sense in, in the structured data, data mining. Cognitive computing, one of its applications, one of its core applications, not the only one, is to find sense in multi-structures. So there's a direct analogy. So when you talk about cognitive computing in the broader uh, uh, context, finding sense in, really, it's geared towards finding sense in the unstructured sources, the multi-structured sources. Right. Um, so in many ways, you can look at as, there's, mining, there's data mining, there's text mining, there's sense mining or semantic mining. You can use the word mining. You could, uh, you know, a qualifying number of ways. Uh, but like it's, you know, when you're talking about cognition here, you know, we're mining it for is a senses that you can then graph out, um, graph model of one sort or another. You know, as opposed to say, you can graph out the relationships in, a, in an affective context as well in terms of sentiment or patterns of influence based on, you know, um, people's feelings about this or that topic. So in, in the middle, it's just the broader concept of mining for, for meaning. Meaning. Mining. <laughs> meaning okay, mining. enough. So do we have Adrian back? I'm here. Okay. Um, okay. Do you want to 
the elaboration on your diagram here as far as the foundation maps to cognitive computing sure. and some of your permutations on that. Sure, sure. And in fact, um, I just I said I just pushed the button a second. An updated version of this will appear with the hashtag of uh, cognitive computing. This is my first um, statement to to talk about a stack for cognitive computing, you know, the, with the foundation technologies of um, data management and analytics. And of course, you have below that a lot of things with uh, hardware and workloads, workflow and architecture. Um, but what I wanted to get was the idea that learning is kind of the central thing without which um, none of the stuff really matters in terms of uh, context. But I, uh, for those of you that are looking at the, the slide on the webinar, um, actually kind of made an overlap between perception and learning to account for the learning that goes on outside of natural language processing and outside of um, the systems that we're talking about with Watson when you get to Google Brain and, and Project Atom because that's, as we said earlier, learning based on experience, but there's no language involved. Right. Uh, I think that I, I've been putting or promoting lately is uh, the thing between structured and unstructured really bothered me for a long time because my my feeling is that if it's really if there's no structure then data it's noise it's the fact that we haven't identified the structure yet been able to extract out the patterns within that structure so if we know that it's natural language if we know that something's written in English uh, and we have reason to believe that it's actually valid English then the structure there it's just not uh, something the the surface level like you would have with um, data records. No, that's an excellent point, and we're going to pick up on that um, uh, on the two slides here. Before we do that, Tony, a couple of things that stood out on a couple of your tweets, and I kind of like this, this whole notion of, of not representation and design serendipity, which is, which is another fundamental part of the differentiating between, you know, cognitive computing and just you know, uh, data. If, can you elaborate on that? Uh, in uh, in the uh, blog post and uh, uh, the AI and, and the emphasis uh, on uh, the fact that uh, it's very long on the A, the artificial part, and short on the I, the intelligence yeah. part, uh, I, I, I was really trying to say there that I think for the people that have declared victory in AI, basically because we are getting quite sophisticated in, in uh, machine learning techniques. We've got more and more of this big data everywhere. You know, I think it's premature to declare victory, and I worry about the same sort of hype cycle that ha happened uh, back in the late 80s and early 90s around the last wave of AI. Uh, it didn't come to fruition. So I think we're closer now. We've got better technology, but I was trying to make the point that, that uh, explicit knowledge representation isn't really the same as just doing text processing or natural language processing, and it's even not the same as doing, uh, uh, you know, machine learning where you expose patterns and you try to make predictions based on those patterns. That's a step, that's an enabler, but I think you really have to take the knowledge and, and encode it in some way and make it explicit and, and reusable. I think the difference, if people are familiar with the notion of tacit knowledge versus explicit knowledge, so I'm, I'm a cook. I can, uh, you know, make a recipe and, and just kind of do it without even thinking or reflecting on it. But if somebody asks me to describe how I make something, it's very difficult for me sometimes to to describe that process and all the little things you just do about how much you, of an event you put in and when you know it's right. That's really what we have to get to to be able to to have uh, these really uh, cognitive systems and systems that can really uh, you know, act uh, at least semi-autonomously. Yes, and that's what you mean about designing serendipity to be able to kind well, of you know meld implicit with it, you know it, you know or tacit with it with the explicit. That's an excellent. Point. Yeah, I, I worry in that case about the you know we we talked a long time about uh, ago about the filter bubble that was coming up in uh, in search right uh, and and the fact that people would uh, would get down deeply into some of the same sorts of things that they found before for the topics that they put into search engines that they would never discover other things going on around them. Well, I worry about the same thing with machine learning, that, that we're, yep. with all the learning, uh, that we're just going to reinforce our existing knowledge and existing biases. So I do think we have to, to refine things in different ways. We have to be able to move up uh, the graph uh, if there's a, an up in a hierarchy, I guess. So we right. have to be able 
able to kind of explore other paths through the graph and bring into play other uh, aspects of knowledge that might not necessarily be obvious, but that's where real sort of creativity comes in and where we begin to get to things that are more like versus uh, purely machine process. But I think we're a ways away from that. Right? Yeah. Well, we're gonna, yeah, we're that's gonna, that's gonna, we're gonna, uh, do you have one more point, Adrian? Keep going. I, I, I'll make the point later on. Oh, okay. great. So, so as I mentioned, one of the key layers in the previous uh, diagram, the five stack layer, where we're going to concentrate on the machine learning, the reasoning, and then the uh, the user engagement. This is, uh, you know, so really, you know, so machine learning is a branch of AI. So the algorithms are processing the data; they're drawing the conclusion. And there's, there's, it's pretty much broken down to, you know, to two buckets with different methods, you know, supervised and supervised. And uh, this is not meant to be thorough. This is the the typical, you know, algorithms and what the goal is uh, in terms of doing this, and um, and we'll get to deep learning in a bit. But this is a recent. Uh, the quote at the bottom was 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 when you really think about it, you know, uh, you know, you say, well, you might have thought about it, but when when uh, Matthew Zeller uh, made this, you know, in this Wired article, explicit, you know, Google's really more a machine learning company, and a lot of companies are turning it. You know, you can make the same thing with Facebook. And Watson is a lot of machine learning, and it's really interesting to to uh, it's really pretty much the new black uh, machine learning on the uh, on the on the um, um, is uh, is basically taking you know replacing MapReduce. So getting back to the symmetry between data and cognitive computing, a major Hadoop uh, distributor has made Spark part of their distribution. And it's it's uh, when Google says we're not using MapReduce anymore, well, no fooling. No one else really is either. It's moving to Spark, and it's all now being applied to other data stores, Cassandra, MongoDB. And, and it's not IBM starting to team in. Same. What's that? Not, yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I just want to point out that we've we've also committed to bringing Spark more completely into our solution as well. Yes. We're Excellent. a provider. Point of, point yes. of so you're starting to see now uh, deployment, you know, in in the ETL, in you know, uh, in, for complex for streaming, and that's why you know, in this diagram here is that for streaming data, um, uh, it's 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 uh, the performance is like 100x, you know, MapReduce, and you're starting to see it to applied for use cases and churn, you know, fraud detections, analytics, and so forth. So it's really it's uh, I think there was a conference this week, the Spark conference. Um, one, one. Uh, this was a pretty interesting post. Uh, uh, Decretization of machine learning, and uh, this depiction here from GraphLab actually was the GraphLab conference this week. Kind of just takes you through this automation process of the data sources to the ETL, and then you know using you know a, a batch uh, static dynamic models to be able to make these predictions. Um, uh, it, one of the things that stood out to me is when just, you know, my curve is better than your curve demos, they think, uh, you know, this, this, this metric was pretty interesting. 80% to 90% of the use cases can be life cycle uh, without requiring specialized deep engagement. Or, and we're going to get into this notion of, of you know, there's going to be a need for data scientists, but if you can automate a lot of this, then you can you know, I guess get closer to the goal of democratization of machine learning. Comments from the panel? It will be democratized in the future to the extent that literally it's available everywhere ubiquitously at low or no cost. And that demand cloud computing on the back end. It will demand mobile and really, you know, any, any, any form factor client on the front end have access to machine, the outputs of machine learning models and so forth. Um, but also democratization of machine learning means the tools for building and tuning machine learning models need to be so, I'm going to use the word foolproof, need to be so easy and so embedded in the experience of developing apps or, you know, knowledge or whatever that we don't even realize that we're doing it. Everybody's doing it. Everybody's sharing their knowledge and to, to you know, to tune Really, you know, fundamentally, it, machine learning is all about it, 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 cognitive computing is all about machine learning, assist human learning, and human learning. Right. The judgments of experts and just regular people, the crowdsourcing of intelligence, improve machine learning. You know, to continue to adapt the models to the results. So, democratization will have been uh, will be a reality when all of that has happened, and we're nowhere near as an industry 
you know, enabling ubiquitous machine learning on the back end, ubiquitous on the front end, theory versus Watson, you know, spectrum, as well as, you know, real-time user-friendly interactive visual development tools. If, if we're around today, we'll be using it to develop, you know, Hadoop map reduce models and so forth. But we're, even that, Hadoop, you know, has, even though it's the biggest of the new approaches to big data, has achieved nowhere near anywhere anywhere near democratization in that sense in terms of broad right. applicability yet. Yep, yep. So in the interest of time, I'm going to move on. What I wanted to point out from this slide is dollars. I mean, machine learning is a new black. There's a lot of dollars flowing. This is this is a partial list. There's a lot more, but this gives you an idea of the you know. Uh, uh, very field startups that are that are getting you know you know twenty thirty forty million fifty million, but it's the money starting to flow big time and there's a combination of different methods. Some of these are deep learning plays uh, uh, like Vicarious, um, and and others are using some of the methods. The newest the newest big player to the group was the the, the announcement of the uh, uh, Microsoft Azure Machine Learning, and that, that's a significant effort as well. So, you know how um, you know how hot machine learning is even in yeah. Old, a great like Bill Gates, somebody of my generation who has nothing to prove. Has Bill, he's the richest man on earth. He's this great philanthropist. Even he, I can you can read in interviews with him recently. It's like God, if he was going to get back in the game, he says machine learning would be it. Yeah, you know, he'd focus on all of that. It's like, like even if somebody like Bill Gates is getting re-energized by machine learning, you know it's hot. You know it's that's actually a, that's, hot. <laughs> that's a valid point. That's a valid yeah. point. So, so getting back to what we just touched on, and some, you know, this whole notion of automating the data scientists. This is a provocative post by uh, by uh, Louis Durant, talking about, and this it reinforces what you just stated uh, in, uh, previously, Jim, regarding you know, the makeup of data scientists. And his, he was really emphasizing the the they really need to know machine learning because that's that's you know, that's really the the fundamental uh, key of. Of, of what we've been talking about in the previous slides. Comments? I'll lead to something else. <laughs> okay. Move on. Because I've been on a rant again. Again, yeah, turn so, data science. Okay. So, the data just science most people are a developer. Yeah. So, so, right. So, it's really boils down, down. So, this really kind of segues into this, uh, this other kind of interesting post regarding algorithms. I mean, again, you're always going to have teams of data scientists, and there was a question about moving forward with uh, in, the, in the white paper that you'll get. Uh, will there be a need for more data scientists for cognitive computing, equal number or less? And I forget how the metrics panned out, but but basically, uh, this, this you know, as the sophistication of the algorithms, you know, can that are embedded into semantic models to do what they're doing, you can not have uh, uh, you know the algorithm, more sophisticated algorithms becoming you know the power designers. That's the whole purpose of that slide there. Um, and you know the thing is that you know I think automated algorithms are really good at generating prototype after prototype or iteration after mm -hmm. iteration. You'll still need, and that's the notion of explicit knowledge. It can be automated the generation yep. of it uh, of explicit patterns. Um, you still need the tacit knowledge of human beings, either subject matter experts or crowdsourcing just the average person who then feedback, no, that model doesn't, or that pattern doesn't make sense. Yes, that does. That's closer. To feedback our human judgments continually into this automated system that's producing one pattern after another to help refine the models to make sure they're, they're still on track with what the other consumer or stakeholder, human beings, experience. So, you know, like I said, machine learning and human learning need to be they're, they're really codependent. It's it's a codependent process of of, of uh, continuing to iterate and refine those. I like Always. that. I like I, I I totally agree with, with that. It is a codependent process. But it's this is interesting observation by Zenon Koshla, Three Predictions for the Future of Health. So he you know he's very much you know maybe it's a little exaggerated, but it's a pretty high number of eighty percent of what doctors do being replaced by machines, you know, the whole notion of, to your point, still tailor-made, that whole human-to-machine interaction, and, uh, and, uh, and the whole consumer tech, you know, similar to the, you know, the IBM, you know, a couple up with, with, uh, with Apple, which we're going to cover here. Um, I wanted to make a cutout on deep learning, because this is, uh, 
they uh, uh, it uses multi-layer neural networks that are teaching, you know, and, we, and we'll, we'll talk about, you know, the Google Brain Project and then, you know, Microsoft's answer to it. But uh, there it is, Project Adam. So, so it's it's being applied to a number of things. Speech is very big. Okay, so you're seeing a, a move from, uh, you know, Microsoft has it, Google has it, Apple is doing it right now. Uh, we talked about the images, and you're seeing the improvements already. You know, the voice condition in Android, Skype uh, translate will be coming out um, later this year for run translation is pretty impressive if you've seen the demos. And you can just see in the images, these are pretty interesting metrics. Humans can match 97.53. But uh, Facebook beat it, or was close to it, but then the Chinese University of Hong Kong has a 99 uh, with a, without a classifier neural network. So, so the whole point, and that's comment here, um, reading uh, the little models, uh, this, is, this is work that other companies are doing, like Numeta. They said after nine years of research, they mimic the way the brain works, and that plays into continuing iteration of, of, of cognitive computing. I wanted to get, in the interest of time, with just 16 minutes left, I want to talk about the top level, the UI, the application engagement. So what I came up on here is more um, rather than just having, you know, uh, the typical BI, you know, uh, user interfaces. With cognitive computing, my contention is that it's contingent upon the vertical use case and who's the targeted user, whether it be a clinician, a knowledge worker, or a consumer? And I just did, okay, for lines, you can, you know, when you're doing topological graphs of different cancer type, uh, types and shapes and meetings, these cutouts from EOSTE, it's that space for collaboration, something, or if it's customer service, maybe it's that intelligent personal agent. Comments from the panelists? Well, I, this is Harris. I, I, I do think. Uh, uh, going back to one of the, uh, I think, challenges of cognitive computing that was raised, you know, we, we make a business case around it. I think this sort of thing really does begin to get to the, the real cases, whether it's uh, amenitive in a in a decision support sort of way, helping a doctor with diagnoses, uh, content discovery, uh, you know, personal assistance, product recommendations, all sorts of things. And I wanted to raise the point. We spent quite a bit of time there on machine learning. Um, I don't equate cognitive computing with machine learning exclusively. I, I like to think of uh, four, four approaches, and you can sort of slice and dice this different ways uh, to getting to cognitive computing or semantic technologies. And I think constructive uh, ontologies, constructive knowledge modeling, like uh, whether it's done you know, by groups or, or individuals or crowdsourced in the, in the, the semantic web, uh, the linked open data models are very valuable ontologies uh, that can be used for cognitive computing today in practical business. Um, that can come from that. Machine learning, if we move from just using the patterns to really analyzing the patterns and building explicit knowledge models and doing that uh, iteration that I think Jim mentioned where you have to have that feedback loop and you you begin to realize the, the data that you're uh, inducing to, to create explicit uh, knowledge models. There's, there's uh, what I like to call uh, gen uh, generative or uh, uh, probabilistic models, I think, as well, uh, that can be for particularly uh, everyday sorts of tasks where you don't have to have high accuracy, but uh, you want to look for uh, less and disruptive sorts of things, so for content discovery, for personal assistance, for calendars, and just everyday sorts of tasks. So I think we have to bring in to, to bear a lot of different approaches, uh, and and uh, and based on the use case, that will dictate the approach and, and how much we want to invest in that and what the business return is on it. Yeah, I like this, um, this slide because you've got um, the, the the topical map of 14 cancer types, and oncologist, a doctor who focuses on cancers and diagnosis and treatment, would use these this kind of these kind of these kinds of maps. What I'm getting at is that if you look at targeted users, um, like for example, an oncologist trying to diagnose uh, the cancer, or whether it's it's likely to spread, or whether it already has spread, what they're doing is that they're saying if they should be doing is they should be a scientist. They should have a scientific approach, meaning they're gathering more evidence, they're weighing it against their prior hypothesis, and 
and they're saying, what do I know and not know? With what degree of probability? Very probabilistic. And they hope, uh, you know, hopefully, the cognitive computing application will give them guidance on going throughout the investigation. Gather this data, look there, um, try this treatment, and see if they respond, so forth. That the back end system, whether it be Watson or somebody, something else, is is irrelevant. Uh, should then allow give allow that scientist, essentially, psychologist, mm -hmm. to get closer to a confirmation of some hypothesis actually, you know, that, that it gets deep down to the cofactors that they're looking for so they can treat it effectively. So that's, you know, very much you always have to provide the guidance geared to the specific decision points being uh, confronted by somebody who hopefully is, is using a, a scientific critical data-driven framework for, for decision-making. You know, it doesn't have to be an oncologist or somebody with a, a high degree. It could be a consumer. The word consumer is there. It could be a consumer who is just look at, trying to look for the best buy, buy whatever, in the marketplace. There's many different kinds of products that might meet their needs, and the advisor would help them work through decision tree in terms of finding the best product of what sort to meet, to buy whatever outcome they're trying to achieve. Hopefully doing it in a more of a scientific manner so they can have great confidence that the answer they arrive at is pretty well the best or close enough. Exactly. Yeah. So in interest of time, I'm going to move yeah. on. Oh, let me interrupt. We do have a question from the attendees here really yeah, quick before ahead. we get too much further. Um, do still cognitive computing and semantic computing still need a soul behind it to make decisions? What branch in semantic computing deals with the storage of decision paths for automation? And I'll answer it, and I'll let the other panelists answer the second. Yeah, cognitive computing needs, and semantic computing need a soul, meaning you need human judgment to do the modeling, but also to evaluate the outputs of the models to make sure that they are on track with whatever humans happen to be experiencing, whether it be educated humans or just average humans. So, yeah, you definitely need a, quote, unquote, soul, human judgment somewhere, many places, the overall process of building and tuning and using the outputs models. In terms of the second one, what branch of semantic computing deals with the storage of decision paths for automation, I don't know. So I'm totally yeah, come back to better clue than me. Um, and maybe in a follow-up. One thing I wanted to get across is is the UI for, for mobile. You know, when you're bringing – and by the way, there's another Watson. It's called AT&T Watson. It's a speech platform. <laughs> I'm not sure how that pans out regarding, you know, trademark. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, just, I can't pass without throwing out um, a, an alternative view. And a lot of what we're doing with cognitive computing, I would say we don't need a soul. I don't think that in the mm -hmm. diagnostic area in some of these things, mm -hmm. that there's a check, nothing to do with what we think of in terms of humanity. And I want to make sure that that, that view is presented because there's a lot of stuff going out now in terms of how much of this when robots take over, kind of right. Thing. So, right. <laughs> so, so the reason I tease them again, I just use them. I mean, they're, they're you, know, you know, IBM is their own speech program. There's Nuance, mm -hmm. uh, each one of the big companies. But the whole point here is bringing in other modalities. You know, bringing in, you know, I mean, the whole notion of you know, automatic speech recognition, gestures, emotions. There's a yep. lot of other parameters regarding the dialogue management, in addition to the natural language processing. So the point that a lot of this is being rolled into Cortana, Bing. Uh, three, uh, with uh, Watson, um, uh, uh, and, uh, and then of course with Google, there's uh, with Google now and the knowledge graph. So it's, there's a lot of other types of, of uh, you know uh, parameters that have to be factored into the scheme. Rather than what you really see in big data, this is again the different you know one of the differentiators is there's all these other modalities. Okay, and speaking of it, just the news last week with uh, with what is kind of interesting here uh, is now Watson and uh, well not just Watson but IBM and Apple so this is sort of like really interesting to where there, you can actually have intelligence at the interface combined with intelligence on the back end and you can see here uh, was really uh, that I teased that article is that there's you know very specific interfaces depending on what the use case is and as you have a generalist 
Texas, and I couldn't resist when I saw this news of bringing in the old concept piece, the Apple Knowledge Navigator from 1987, <laughs> which really is a marvelous piece, by the way, in terms of, yep. and I remember this, uh, uh, maybe the deforestation in the Amazon versus deforestation, that's why Africa's over there, which, you know, where you're really, you know, it really goes way beyond the capabilities what we see today in Cortana, Google Now, and Siri. And I, for Watson, of course, was just adapted to speaking to Alex Trebek in a game show setting, you know, so we've gone well beyond that. Yeah, I'm joking. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think you Oh, go ahead. No, we definitely, we've, we've, in terms of Ivan Watson, we've very much built applications for specific uh, applications like healthcare and so forth that uh, use very specific interfaces to those decision point um and so forth. So yes, that's that's quite important. And some of the theory is more of like you indicate here a general assistant. Um right. you know, going forward, IBM's gonna tune Siri and other Apple and IBM technologies to the specific uh, conversational computing requirements of different decision points. So I think there'll be a blending going forward. I'm not speaking on behalf of IBM, this is just my feeling personally. Mm -hmm. There'll be a blending of sort of the, the general capabilities Capabilities that a Siri provides to, in almost any decision environment, with the more verticalized uh, capabilities of, of Watson for particular applications uh, and so forth. Uh, it's, it's, it's extremely likely to happen. Let me just say it that way. So, um, so again, uh, the competition is intensifying. Again, it's kind of a pull through, but basically, it isn't. You know, there's startups as well. We talked about you know machine learning startups, but uh, it's interesting how. We're, we're, we have the letter. IBM also required the startup uh, Cognia to give personality to virtual assistants. Uh, Cortana is in the game, and that quote from the manager is, we decided to infuse with the personality for better use attachment. Um, the good, you know, Google's talking about full reasoning AI, but uh, uh, Sergey says it's still a few years uh, uh, away yet. But see, you're starting see, to see quite a clamoring and uh, an aggregation of of of, uh, of movement towards adding other types of, of you know, similitude and other elements to you know combined with more functional AI along with personalities. Yes, comment. Steve, uh, this is Tony. I was going to say I don't really care so much if the if the AI or the the cognitive computing. Uh, uh, technology personal assistant has its own personality, but I do care that it understands my personality. So I think that's the, <laughs> yeah, think that's that's the that. textual computing piece that needs to be around here, that it knows where I'm at, what time it is, what I've been yep. doing recently, what I'm likely to be doing next, sort of my objective and goal, what my interests are, what my social network is, and it has all, all that context. So it knows yep. me and it knows what I'm doing, where the inter yeah, personality or not, uh, I don't really care. Right. It's very likely to happen in the industry as a whole as wearables become yeah. adopted more widely. I, I, I bet the, the individual wearables within your personal area and network will have their own distinct personalities. They'll play together as almost yeah. like a, your own personal gang to some degree. Uh, but hopefully they'll all be tuned to your personality like uh, what Tony was just saying. Uh, but... Uh, you know, it would be a society of wearables, each with their own distinct personalities, pl hopefully playing together harmoniously. To right. You. right, right. So, uh, and, yeah, one more quick comment in the interest of time, so we're down to four minutes. Is, oh, we've got one more question here from the audience, Steve, and we just got, we actually have just a couple minutes left. And um, for a knowledge system to be termed as cognitive, what are the mandatory characteristics and features? As you guys are discussing, you guys. Uh, actually, the slide upstream, you know, talk about those three, you know, uh, uh, basically what I would say, we, we covered that in a previous slide, so without belaboring the point. Um, and let's just finish up the next three slides in, in, in one minute here. So the whole notion of, of uh, emotional data, too, is my point in this slide. So there's work going on. This is a laboratory for animal technologies in Auckland. We're doing, you know, you can learn and, and interact in real time. So you're, you, you've got some of the models, you know, uh, baked in to where you can actually, you know, create much more uh, like, you know, uh, personalities that um, that can, you know, that can also emote and, and, and learn about you, getting to some of the previous points. Now, also seeing this in robotics. Now, this is kind of interesting. I was, uh, you know, I just picked this up. 
at the airport is uh, is using these robots. Uh, somebody said well, it looked like an iPad on wheels, but but the whole notion is that there are rather than going to the information booth, you can go to these robots and they'll be able to help you. And this company, Debo, and that's the video. This is Cynthia, uh, Cynthia Brazil from MIT. Uh, she just uh, she just uh, closed five million from a uh, Indiegogo campaign, of, you know, and putting thing out. It's actually quite interesting in terms of being that that personal assistant. Uh, we don't have time to cover, which we'll just uh, uh, touch upon here, is, is bring cognitive capability and neuromorphic neurosyntactic chips right into the chipset. Okay, so actually, you know, this is not meant to replace traditional CPUs or GUs, but it's going to be complementing. Uh, big players that are mentioned here are working on that. We don't even have time. We talked about wearables, but the whole note of the industrial Internet. This consortium that that uh, that, uh, that it, with major players is kicked out for the Internet of Things. That that is a lot. You know, that's going to be ten times in terms of machine learning, and uh, we don't have time to cover mm -hmm. uh, cognitive computing potpourri here. But it's being applied to you know to data centers to be able to look at photos to diagnose you know uh, uh, diseases uh, in you know things like that. And final observations and the close here. Let's just talk about this. Is uh, and we did talk about it. It's not about replacing humans. It's the collaboration, the combined strengths. And Con's final comments from each panelist before we close. Make them, please. Be a weekly. Just cram it all into one hour. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'll plug the, the upcoming forum in San Jose next month. I'll be there. I'm sure the other guys yes, will. Yes, it is. Yeah. Conversation okay. there. That's it. That's the last All right, folks. All right, and we'll hopefully uh, we'll see some of you at at this forum, which is uh, August 2021 20, in San Jose. Wouldn't miss. Do you want to close close the uh, the meeting, uh, San? And thank you, Jen, for this fantastic discussion. It was really just really packed full of a lot of information. As you said, you know, there's it's so hard to get to everything in an hour, but you guys. Really covered a lot. Very some very good points in there, and thank you to the attendees as always for attending and for asking your questions and joining in on the conversation. Always very appreciated. And as everybody said, we hope you will join us at the Cognitive Community Forum August 20th and 21st in San Jose. Hope everyone has a great day, and thank you so much for participating in today's webinar. Thank you. Thank you.